I think you both touched uh, very much on the financing part of this enormous transition and transformation that's uh, going to come. And uh, uh, there has already been, um, as was mentioned, a decision by the EIB to not finance any more fossil projects. We're seeing the Green Deal, a sustainable investment plan. I thought it was in incredibly interesting uh, what Mr. Fabiou said about taxation. It needs, needs to be uh, transparent and it also needs to go to this transition. But how do we mobilize also the private capital? Uh, I would uh, like to have you more, uh, more views on this. Uh. Thank you. Um, yes. Um, we need money. Uh, we need public money first, uh, because there are a certain number of activities uh, in the domain of uh, fight against uh, climate change which cannot take place uh, without public money. It's the reason why uh, it has been said that in 2020, uh, the rich countries must bring at least $100 billion uh, to the developing countries uh, for uh, the climate. And uh, we are going in that direction. Uh, it's not clear cut. The figures are difficult to assess. There is different studies. But it's an absolute necessity first to bring uh, public money. Uh, why? Let's take the instance of Africa, black Africa. The Africans are the double victims of climate change. Uh, first, they don't contribute to emitting um, GHG. And at the same time, they will be the first victims. And uh, if uh, you want to build uh, piers against the floods, if uh, you want uh, to build uh, some uh, public equipment, if you want uh, to have systems of alert uh, when there are uh, typhoons, uh, you need public money first. But the public money, which is absolute necessity, is small compared to the private money. And um, private money um, is uh, required uh, and um, not only for moral reasons, but for <laughs> financial reasons as well. Uh, there has been a very interesting uh, study, uh, first made by the previous uh, governor of the Bank of England, uh, Mark Carney, who has just uh, been appointed as a special envoy uh, for UN in this domain. And Carney uh, speaks about what he called the tragedy of the horizons. What is it? It is the fact that uh, both in uh, governments and sometimes in um, private uh, companies' activities, uh, you uh, decide to prefer the short-term view than the long-term view. And this is a contradiction. He called that the tragedy of the horizons. And he said that if uh, we uh, don't fight against this tragedy, uh, there will be a financial uh, drama and a climate financial bubble. Why? First, because uh, climate change is destroying a lot of uh, assets. Second, because you can imagine what, is, uh, the, what are the consequences on insurance companies, because it's billions and billions, and uh, third, because uh, you have to take into the consideration the fact that if really, as we want it, we go to a, a low carbon society, it means that you have to remain in the ground, uh, coal, uh, vast amount of oil and gas which means that the assets, the value of the companies uh, which are based on coal, on uh, oil, and on gas will change. And therefore, we have to prepare that, to accompany that. 
And therefore, uh, the companies have to take that in their programs. It is the reason why, more and more, uh, the uh, sovereign funds, the private funds, uh, the great banks, the public bonds, uh, are more and more inclined to take into consideration uh, the um, climate elements, the climate risk of their assets, and to go step by step uh, towards financing the renewable uh, more uh, than uh, the fossil fuel industry. For all these reasons and many other reasons, uh, we have a growing and very impressive feeling in different uh, financial uh, sectors that this has to be taken in consideration and that more and more it has to be financed. Well, I, I, I feel that the, in the private sector there is a uh, growing realization that uh, we have moved from the old times of charity, of supporting environmental causes, to the corporate social responsibility, a special office in the big companies, uh, into realizing that this work is of strategic significance. Because the, I know some, several of the CSR experts which were recruited from the UN or Oxfam, they're now sitting in the strategic, strategic staff of CEOs of huge companies. So there is a realization out of enlightened self-interest to go that direction. I was seated, I was at a dinner in New York uh, with uh, people representing the pension funds and equity funds and I counted the eight people around the table was about two trillion dollars. And they all said, my son is complaining that I'm not doing enough on the environment and climate. What should I do? And then I realized we have a cultural gap here. We have a curse over our organizations, both in government and in the UN, of working in silos. We need to work instead horizontally and, organ and mobilize the actors that are ne needed and take away those cultural barriers. Because they were more or less begging us from the UN side to come up with ways of pulling uh, them coming to the decision that they should invest so and so much. So uh, I would say we are, we should also have a, a conceptual change of working horizontally because this issue will force us in a positive way to work horizontally. Now I would add to what Jan said that uh, there are still many contradictions. Uh, let's take the introduction to stock exchange of Aramco. Uh, Aramco is the most profitable company in the world. Uh, Aramco uh, is producing oil, and it is the uh, cheapest uh, cost uh, for producing oil. But it's based on oil. If Aramco has uh, to keep uh, a part, important share of his oil in uh, the earth, the value of Aramco may be a bit different. But, uh, however, it has been introduced uh, in the stock, and it's the highest introduction uh, which has ever been done uh, in stocks. Therefore, there is still a margin for evolution. Thank you. I think we'll take two quick questions, and then we'll let Jan maybe answer first, uh, in case you need to go. Here we have a question. Please, please say your name also. We'll stand up and stand up in the darkness. Uh, maybe we can put some light <laughs> uh, so we can see each other. Irma Sudin, Stockholm Resilience Center. Thanks for many things that is very easy to endorse and happy that it's um, put on the floor. But I would like to uh, uh, ask about this strange interval between the optimist and the sort of pessimists, sort of the swaying of where you would find yourself. And it deals with a sort of emergence that we see from the research side uh, of the flipping point issues. So we don't only have the curves, and the curves have to be bent. Yes, they have to be bent now already in COP25 and uh, better uh, COP26. And that is a sort of uh, bending curves that you think you have control over. But there are issues now emerging 
and it has been on the radar screen uh, for quite some time on those flip-flops with regard, let's say, to the Amazonas, uh, Goldstream uh, things, and I don't need to repeat the list. But what is the politicalness in the absorption of not only bending the curves as they are sort of smoothly changing, but unfortunately smoothly being greater and greater, but we have more closer concerns. And that would also frighten, um, hopefully, the political system in order to shift also the activism in the in-between of the optimist and the pessimist. So what about the flip-flops and the political assessment of the new situation? Yeah, 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 yeah. So question about the flip-flops. Do we have a second short question here? <clears throat> Hi, my name is, is this one? my name is Jeet Mystery. I work for WWF, the conservation organization. And it's great you're talking about finance, because one message which doesn't come out is that the economic benefits of the transition are actually enormous. Mm -hmm. And they say there's a, there's a figure which is $26 trillion above business as usual. So my question is, why isn't that message coming out? That when you put the money in, mm -hmm. you're going to get a massive return. And, um, I guess I've been following the UK elections and there's a lot of talk about investments and stuff and, and people phone in and say, well, I mean, like, this is going to cost so much, but nobody, no politician is even talking about the returns that you can make as well. So mm. that's my question. Very good. Jan? Well, I, I met a senator recently uh, in Washington and uh, he made that point, you know, that uh, if you look at uh, the uh, people working uh, on coal mines, about 70,000 or so, uh, people working on renewable energy was at least three or four hundred thousand, and he made the point that it is actually the absolutely necessary for uh, industry to move into that next stage in order to survive. And I think that's a very good argument because I think in order to stay optimistic, you need to have a strategy that uh, both includes the need to for us to do the right thing for next generations and for ourselves but also that it is the right thing to do for strategic and economic reasons. Uh, and that's why the, the move to a strong and convincing theory on mobilizing resources in all sectors uh, for the uh, climate change work, uh, including the Sustainable Development Goals, is such a great idea. I think everything builds on the fact, in the end, to do the right thing in combination with the light and self-interest. Yes, um, but the, the flip-flop, uh, you, you're right. Uh, it's not enough to bend the curve, or uh, it's, the question is to bend it uh, dramatically. Uh, but it's difficult to explain to people that uh, when the CO2 is emitted in the atmosphere, uh, it does not come down, or it comes down after years and years and years. And therefore, it's the reason why it is a race against time. And people have the feeling that if there is a small change, it's OK, it's enough. No, unfortunately, it's not OK. Because there is a moment where um, it's for eternity. Now, about uh, the fact that from an objective point of view, uh, the uh, <clears throat> fight against climate change uh, can bring money and be positive. Why uh, isn't it understood uh, by everybody? Well, the question is that uh, the interests uh, which are at stakes are not the same. Uh, imagine, but I don't think it will be likely that you will be uh, the CEO of one of the major companies. Um, you are invested deeply in coal, in oil, or in gas. And science shows that if we want to go to a low carbon society, we have to abandon a lot of them, which uh, poses a real economic problem for your company. 
which is powerful, at a worldwide level, at a general interest level, uh, to change that is positive for society, but in between there is a contradiction between the different interests. And, uh, okay, we know how the society uh, is run, and uh, honestly, it's not easy, because uh, there are so many shifts that uh, some uh, major company do hesitate. And we, we see that if, if uh, we are lucid. Uh, now, coal has a very bad press, okay. But uh, still, in Asia in particular, uh, there's a lot of coal. Uh, oil, it's so-so. And the new element, full of promises, is gas. But gas is a fossil fuel uh, energy. And uh, if, uh, and these companies, uh, I don't want to simplify, to oversimplify, these companies are very powerful, very powerful. And uh, therefore, uh, when you say it's positive for the world in terms of finance, yes, but it depends on the sectors of the world. Thank you. Jan, you wanted a last comment. No, well, uh, I, I'm sorry. We have an important CIPRI event in a few minutes, so I have to leave. But I, I forgot to prove the point about uh, interdependence and how the goals are, are mutually reinforcing. And I want to take the, as a starting point, the cities. You are SDG number 11, of course, and the different tar targets below that. But I would advise you to also look into other goals that are relevant for your work. Goal number seven on energy, goal number six on water, goal number nine on, uh, on uh, innovation and infrastructure, Goal number 12 on uh, sustainable consumption and production. Goal number 13, of course, on climate. By that, you will have allies. You will bring in other actors who are active in these fields. And by that, you will have an enormous energy coming out of the work. So I advise you to go horizontal, <laughs> horizontal again. Uh, I, my last point is simply to tell you that I have brainwashed my family. <laughs> so my grandson, six years old. He now knows all 17 goals. <laughs> Boys and girls should have the right, the same rights. And people should not live in big poverty. <laughs> Things like that with the child's language. So my next conference that I hope to organize uh, on the SDGs, I will try to make a movie of him <laughs> giving the 17 goals. So go home and do some homework, if I may say so, undiplomatically. Good idea. Thank you very much.